my name is Doug Polk, and welcome to Polker News for this week on 2 Plus 2 presented by Upswing Poker. We've got a great show lined up for you today with topics including Marcel Lusk suing poker stars, Sheldon Adelson in the Las Vegas Review Journal, and EPT increasing payouts to 20%. But before we get into any of those topics, I want to kick it off by talking about week one of the Bankroll Challenge. For those of you that don't know, week one was a bit of a struggle. We started off with $100 and managed to turn it into $85 by the end of the week. Our lowest low was a $45 point in our final session, which ended up being a 19 hour grind to try and get a $10 deposit bonus. Easily the most rewarding $10 I've made in my life, ending the week at 85 bucks. Now for some reason, when people have watched these videos or all of the plays so far, been making a lot of snide and mean comments such as <laughs> definitely makes me feel better about my microstakes play <laughs> or wow maybe microstakes are just not beatable or Doug is really playing too spewy so microstakes are really simple you just play ABC poker and I got one thing to say to all of you that are hating on me right now I just thought I would win in week one why why it's one cent, two cents. Come on, Doug. Our first story here tonight is Sheldon Adelson in the Las Vegas Review Journal. For those of you that don't know, Sheldon Adelson owns the Las Vegas Review Journal as well as the Venetian properties. There's clearly quite the conflict of interest here as both the news and what the news is reporting on are owned by the same person. There's a process that's put into place if there is to be news on any of his properties that he gets final say and is allowed to change or edit what happens in these articles. A really good analysis of the situation and what's going on happened on last week tonight with John Oliver, I believe not this past episode but the one before. Definitely check that out if you're interested in learning more about Sheldon Adelson. Anyway, the question that kind of this brings to me is, you know, especially as someone that lives in Las Vegas, why is this type of behavior allowed? I mean, owning the news and owning the casinos and then getting to have a final say or veto articles or change them. In fact, sometimes the articles are changed in ways that the, the writers don't approve of. And when they ask for their name to be taken, taken off of the article, they are denied. This is absolutely absurd that someone gets that kind of power where they get to just say what the news is because they own the news and they own the casino. So they just get to decide everything. That really lacks transparency. And I can't help but feel like this type of situation often happens in other areas. The world of poker is an interesting one. I don't know what's going on at every news headquarters. But what I can say is this. I think that you might find that this type of level of ownership is going to occur across the board as well. And I have to recommend getting into the lab at Upswing Poker. It is the best value per dollar you can spend on learning. I would highly recommend it. I've put hundreds of hours into it. And frankly, you're going to be a better player. Do you want to be a better player? Because if you want to be a better player, head over to UpswingPoker.com and get in the lab. Our next story tonight is the EPT increasing its payout from 15 to 20 percent in its tournaments. I know this might not seem like a big deal and a lot of people are going to be like, so what? But I think it sets a bad precedent and is a step in the wrong direction. Let me give you an extreme example so you can understand what happens as more of the field is paid out. Let's say that 100 percent of the field was paid out. Well, then what would happen is you would buy in and you get your buy in back minus the rake. I know that's not going to happen before 10 people tell me. But the point remains, the closer you get to this, the less people are actually able to be winning players because they have a lower ceiling on the amount they can win. If 50% of the field paid out, it would be a lot worse because now there's less money for good players to win and the bad players are more likely to cash. Now, I understand for bad to medium players, this is a good change that will help them, but I don't think that's what poker is all about. If we take away the skill from poker, why does anyone even want to play and you can't even be a professional player over the long run? I mean, no one wants to see an ecosystem where people can't play poker and actually make a living. We need to make sure that we can say whatever we can to try and prevent this from going into effect. I mean, obviously the EPT, it's a done deal, it's going to happen. But I'm saying as a community, 
We need to band together and use our voices to be heard that they know and these term agencies organizations know that this is not a change we find acceptable. We need to make sure the game of poker is a game of skill and luck. That's fair. It allows bad players to sometimes win, but good players to win the long run. That's what makes the ecosystem complete. But as we move over to more of these game types that are knockout tournaments or spinning goes or anything like that, Zoom Poker is a not quite as good example, but still one. As we move over to these game types, what happens is companies keep the weak players in and they don't help the, the winning players actually find a way to win money. So there needs to be some kind of line there on what can happen and what can protect the sport of poker to allow good players an opportunity to win money. And I know there's a lot of people that are like, Doug, man, like, you're sticking up for all the good players, but all the recreational players. Look, I understand. I do think it's good that there are people looking out for the recreational player because that is best for the ecosystem. But you can't take away the dream of becoming a top player. If you take away that dream, what is there left in poker, right? Why start at the micros and dream of one day being the next whoever if you can't do it, if you can't make it? The dream is what keeps poker alive. The dream is what makes poker great. And I want to make sure that that's protected moving forward so this game will be just as great in 30 years as it is right now. I got stones enough not to chase cards, actions, or fucking pipe dreams of winning the World Series on ESPN. Our final story today is Marcel Lusk suing poker stars, alleging that they owe him $25,000 a year for the use of his international poker rules. Now, before we get too much into exactly, what, into exactly what's going on with that lawsuit, let's talk a little bit about what these international poker rules are. The international poker rules, the IP rules, consist of 81 technical rules, policies, and procedures. They provide the poker industry and its players with a standardized set of tournament procedures, tournament guidelines to train, operate, and play by. And if we take a look at the kinds of things that are underneath this, it's tournament staff, you know, penalties, starting chips, unprotected cards, betting line, all kinds of different stuff that apparently uh, tournaments use or a lot of tournament series use in order to have rules for their tournament. Now, I can't say that I really know much about these rules at all because frankly, until this lawsuit came out, I would never even heard of this. So I can't tell you if these are or not the standard or who or who, who is or who is not right in this lawsuit. I really don't know. But apparently, and this is really what I guess I have a problem with, apparently the deal was, quote, sealed with a handshake. Why not get a written contract? Why not just have an attorney take care of this? These are real world situations. And this is actually kind of another topic, I guess, entirely. But poker players as a whole, and I'm guilty of this. If you're watching it, you're probably guilty of this as well. But far too often, we take agreements that should be legally binding and have a contract and we make it a verbal thing. Now I understand no one likes lawyers. Really, who likes lawyers? There's no one that likes lawyers. So I get not wanting to deal with the fine, not wanting to deal with you know the whole hassle of it. I understand all of that. But at the same time, you are an adult, this is a business agreement, and if you don't have a contract, you have a handshake that you hope some people saw, what does that really mean? Sure, it might be binding. I mean, I'm not sure what the laws, where they shook hands were. It, it probably is binding. It might not be. It might not have happened. It might have happened. But here's the thing. We have to sit here or stand here and argue about whether this should or shouldn't have happened or did it happen. And all you had to do was have an attorney draft up the contract, put it in your international poker rules, list the rules, say what they're going to be used for, and, and agree that we'll be paid $25,000 a year for the use of these rules. That's really all that had to happen. Okay, if you did that and PokerStar signed it, this is an open and shut case, PokerStar owes you the money. So, I can't, again, say that PokerStar is, or did or didn't do this because all we have is this article and frankly, it likely has come from Marcel or someone that knows Marcel or, or someone on that side of things and until you hear the whole story, you can't really jump to conclusions. I will say, out of the gate, it looks bad for PokerStars, assuming that this is a true story. Making an agreement on a handshake is also weird, not just from the Marcel standpoint, but for poker stars too. If I'm a company, why would I want a 25K a year contract to just be a handshake? Like, what do I do? Like, I slip you 25K every year at the World Series of Poker and we call it good? 
This is some full tilt shit, you know? This should have been a, le a legally binding contract between the two parties. I think it's going to be interesting moving forward to see what happens, and hopefully this does set a precedent for poker players to start taking things more seriously. Look, I know in the poker world $10,000, or in this case $25,000, is not a lot of money. I understand that poker is a high-stakes game. People gamble for a lot of money. But that doesn't mean you have to be irresponsible with your money. And kind of in that same vein, when you look at loaning money or giving people money, in general, you should really stay away from doing it. I know we've almost completely changed topics here, but this is something I want to talk about for a second just as a poker player talking to poker players. People are almost always more broke than they're made out to be. And I know a lot of people that are in that position at higher stakes. We're not going to throw people under the bus right now. But there's a lot of players out there that you would imagine are worth millions of dollars, but they're not. And what happens is it's all well, it's all well and good until Brad Booth takes your 30K. And then you have a problem. So don't look at these players and think, you know, oh, he's good for it. I'll just give him some money here. No problem when you really don't know their finances, and frankly, if they need the money, there's probably a problem. So what I would say is, moving forward, if you can get contracts for agreements you make, do that, and be careful with your money in a world that's a dangerous place. That'll do it for us today here at Polker News. If you want to see what I'm up to, head over to Twitter and follow me, Doug Polk Poker, and of course, tune in at DougPolk.tv for the Bankroll Challenge.